hi, I'm John, and I'm a designer at Superflux. And we're a design company that does a lot of work around foresight, innovation, and design. And we're obviously based in London. Now, when I was a kid, I had this like yellow Lego bucket. And it came standard with the Lego pieces inside it. But it was also like filled with random objects that I've kind of like collected and amassed. Bits of like shoelaces, marbles, all sorts of random things. And I find myself constructing things and making things, and making these strange hybrid forms. And it's through that assembling things, through hands-on play, that kind of prescribe who I am today. See, the projects that we undertake at our studio, the end goal is often ambiguous. And we've learned to trust the process of making to give us some sort of clarity around how to go forward in a project. So the title of my talk comes from a quote by Richard Feynman. And it was actually like discovered on the, his blackboard after he died. So it resonates with our studio because we're trying to understand the, the um, sort of shifts happening in the future from tangible outcomes. And what we do in our studio is we try and make some of these tangible outcomes. And these might take the form of products, films, artifacts, or workshops. So the outline of my talk, I'm going to kind of look at the sort of bigger tech landscape. I'm going to look at the sort of like the promises and hypes surrounding technology. I'm going to go into like the sort of realities. And then I'm going to examine two of our projects and go into some more details about some of the challenges and things that we've had to like overcome in our sort of process doing the sort of works that the work that we do. So you're off you might be familiar with all the hype around emerging technologies, and the Internet of Things is no such exception. We're promised that with this um, world of everyday objects connect being connected and smarter, and the benefit that it can empower us and it can make us better. Also, the fact that elderly relatives can live at home for longer because they have all these care devices that they can use and have a better quality of life because of that. And you might have seen like a lot of the IoT products out there at the moment. You have the Fitbit, you know, the um, sort of Amazon Dash button, and the sort of Vitality Glow Caps, which is sort of like uh, a medicine bottle that you know alerts you when you need to take your medicine. And the same can be said for artificial intelligence. We have a lot of advances in AI and robotics going on at the moment. You have the Google DeepMind AI beating a human at the game Go. You have um, autonomous vehicles and drones, like making our lives better and making deliveries better and all this sort of stuff. You even have like financial tech solutions such as Kensho being used in Wall Street to analyze risk better than we ever could. But some of these promises and hypes are sort of very different. This dream to make us feel empowered and make our lives better is um, different from the ground level realities. So the consumer demand for connected home devices is on the decline. This sort of um, graph by Argus Insights shows that it's been on the decline from 2014. And people that buy wearables, you know, after six months of use, most of the cases, um, they stop using them. Also, people that have bought into Amazon Dash, fewer than 50% of them have ever made orders with one. But why is this? This could be because people might be worried that new devices may be rendered useless because the cloud services that they're relying on might sh suddenly shut down overnight. This became the case with the Revolve Home Hub. That suddenly like, shut down because the company kind of moved its revenue to another sort of stream. And we're kind of like, perhaps the smart things that we invest in aren't seamless and efficient as we think they are. You know, they're always going to be filled with glitches and outages. And it's this maturing of technology that takes time. Also, this idea that companies can make money from our most intimate data is quite daunting. You know, there's still a sort of misunderstanding about the culture around data, that you can have a device sitting on your wall and it can generate revenue from your most intimate sort of beha behaviors and habits. It's kind of scary. And going back to this thing around elderly care devices, we recently made a short film for Think Tank, a project exploring the Internet, thing, the internet of Things research. And they commissioned us to make a short fictional thi film looking at the life of like, one such individual and his sort of tensions with smart objects. So this is Thomas. He's an elderly guy, and he's been given all these like, new smart devices by his children. But he kind of defies them, and he becomes kind of, you know, he, wants, he feels that they're kind of 
infantilizing and too paternalistic. And he wants to gain his sense of independence back, and he wants to do things the way that he wants to do them. So this is a short clip from that film that looks at him trying to sort of misuse this, a sort of smart fork. So he's enjoying his sort of fish and chips there while he kind of pokes the, um, the salad with his fork. So the same can be said for artificial intelligence and robotics. Take, for example, this case in China recently, where they shut down a few of their restaurants because the robot waiting staff that they'd invested a lot of money in seemed to break down. They required constant maintenance, and they couldn't like deliver food and basic things that a normal human waiter could do. They couldn't do that as efficiently as a normal human being. Also, AIs might be beating experts at the game Go but it's easier than you might think to fool an AI. So machines, the majority of machines are trained to think that there's readable, important information in every data input. A cough could mean as much to a machine as a sort of um, given command. So in the 1900s, there was a very interesting story about this horse called Clever Hands. And it was um, a horse that could do any mathematical equa equation. You know. But it turns out it wasn't like a math genius. It was really good at reading signals and signs by the audience and by its trainer. So it was good at identifying these visual cues. And the AI that we have created so far are good at like, they have learned enough to give a correct answer, but they don't understand the information as such. So researchers at Berkeley and Georgetown have actually created an algorithm that can issue speech commands to voice assistants with 90% accuracy. And it sounds like white noise to us, but it can be hidden in radio broadcasts and can and if heard, can infect a device with mal malware and make it do like strange things. S and the quality of data being fed into an AI system is another fuzzy area. In the case of Microsoft's Tay chatbot, turning into a genocidal racist overnight, because it was given malicious data and bad functionality, resulting in it to deviate wildly from its original programming. So this is what can happen when machine learning is poorly implemented. So th there was a recent article called Don't Believe the Hype by Chris Arkenberg. And he says that tech doesn't become transformational just because everyone's talking about it. We have to look beyond that hype cycle and situate the tech within its complex ecosystem and ultimately within the deeper needs and fears of the people who are asked to adopt them. Because technology is not the goal. We often tend to imbue technology with the ideals of the peop people who create it and the messages of those who market it. But the technology's true impact will always be defined by those who use it. And the people that do use it are going to do weird, inconceivable things with any technology. Hacking it, misusing it, defying it in the case of Thomas and his smart fork. You know, using a VR headset on a train, or putting a thermo therm thermostat in a fridge because we're too confused at its functionality. So the work we do f focuses around the future not being this one-size-fits-all, shiny version of the future. That technology works and is seamless. It's messy and turbulent. And it's like the inside of that Lego bucket that I was talking about, with various broken and missing pieces. And the tools we design have allowed the public to explore the implications of new developments across science, technology, and politics, to invite them to critique upon what's being put out there in the world. So over the years, working with a range of clients and commissioners, we found ourselves moving just beyond the design of the gadgets or products to being involved in the design of the cultures that they create. So it's not only the design of applications, but to also consider the implications. And by doing so, we are free from designing something that has to be presented in perfect resolution and have the opportunity to consider the mutant nature, nature of technology. In this way, our projects acquire the reality of our rapidly changing times, designing with and for uncertainty instead of resisting it. And finally, this leads to the creation of many alternate visions of the future, that we're able to move away from just the conscientious future towards a messy, hybrid, complicated world we actually find ourselves living in. So now I'm going to examine some of the case studies and take a deeper look at some of the challenges we've had to like, overcome in the work that we do. So 
This is a project, an R&D an R &D project called Drone Avery. And it explores what happens when machine intelligence finds a body and starts occupying the sky above our heads. Now, it was Bruno Latour who said that passenger aircrafts do not fly. It's airlines that fly. And what he meant here was that the wider actors and invisible infrastructures in place enable flight from the flight attendants to the internet deals to the sort of airport and that sort of whole wider infrastructure and actors there. But you could say that drones do not fly. They too rely heavily on the software and flight controllers in order to fly. Yet unlike the narrative of the airline, as Adam Rothstein puts it, the drone remains a speculative technology that has yet to be developed for an application that has yet to exist. And they exist in the strange soup of laws, novelties, expectations, and emerging fictions. So the interest in drones is growing faster than any regulatory framework put upon them. The laws and regulations are changing every day. So take, for example, this case of um, an off-duty security officer crashing his drone into the White House lawn. That caused the drone company to update their firmware overnight so that no drones could fly in the Washington DC no-fly zone. Or a recent case in London where a drone crashed into a passenger aircraft no doubt regulations there will be changed, with MPs saying that they want to introduce a sort of drone register so that people who own high-powered drones put their name on so everyone can see who they are. We're also very interested in trying to map out this new invisible un infrastructure, this city that would have like flight zones, flight paths, and geofences around it, what this might look like. So early on in, our pro in this project, we were met with all these like shiny YouTube videos of people doing amazing things with drones. And with any design project, you, you kind of start off like sketching out and rendering these like fantastical weird forms. And it's easy to get trapped in that cycle, just designing like really interesting, cool things without knowing like what happens when you get your hands on it, what happens when you start flying these things. So we had to like not just sit there doing these renders and theorizing. We had to get under the hood of the technology, building things from scratch, uh, and not just buying off-the-shelf drones, but buying like all the parts that we required. From the autopilot systems, that's like the brains of the drones, we experimented with like experimental Kickstarter ones, uh, buying the Arduipilot system, then settling on 3D Robotics Pixhawk system, which became like the most stablest one that we could get our hands on. And it was this hive of activity in the studio where there were parts surrounding every surface. All my colleagues were kind of like annoyed at us because <laughs> there were bits of drones everywhere and they had to clear a space to be able to like use the desk. But again, there is a learning curve with any technology. So there's an example here with 3D printing. Throughout this project, we somehow acquired a 3D printer. And you know, there's all this hype surrounding it that you can put your object together and it will print out like something that you could take off and use. But that's not the case. You know, we're often met with this like jumble of spaghetti that came out, uh, which we couldn't really do much with. But we had to like learn about that tech and tweak it and understand it and get behind it to really understand what it was capable of. Like this idea of the overhangs and the fills and the slice of software that had to be used. So it's not relying too much and expecting things to work but it's like experimenting with it and tweaking it to like find your sort of way of understanding it. We also had to make most of our parts in-house and we hacked things together. So take these splitter cables, for instance. We made these because there weren't anything that we could buy that had those components on them. And we did a lot of refining by making like simple cardboard models that gave us a better understanding of the form that could make a drone sort of like stable and fly. So it must have been about the 20th attempt that we actually got something off the ground. And it kind of proved to us that every time we went out to test fly a drone, something had gone wrong. You know, the GPS signal had gone wrong. It, it kind of lost signal and maybe looked like it was going to crash for a bit. The propellers kind of broke. And like, because we were testing the drones in the park, like dogs seemed to just run at the drone and think it was some sort of toy. And you kind of had to like jump in there and get them out of the way or something like nasty would have happened which fortunately did not. So it's this kind of like Jugard, MacGyver-like approach where we kind of zip-tied things together and made things that 
didn't exist at the time. So the, the case of this drone where we strapped two frames together because we couldn't find like a 12 rotor quad frame at that time. And I think we must have gone through about 500 zip ties and cable ties in that project. Yeah. So with greater autonomy will come more agency. And this is when things start getting complex and messy. And this is the space that we're interested in exploring. So for the project, we designed five drones. And the drones serve as a touch point, a hook or a node that talk about an issue or concern around bigger technology ideas. So this is Madison, the advertising drone. It uses facial recognition to tailor ads to whoever's in its vicinity. And this is Newsbreaker, the media drone. It flies to a scene or an event, and it writes a news story live using its onboard algorithms. These things are already happening. The first algorithm wrote a news story in Japan about a uh, volcano or earthquake eruption. This is Night Watchman, a um, surveillance drone. It moves quickly through the city like a CCTV camera, collecting data and logging data on the hunt for like civil disobedience. And this is Roothawk, the um, traffic management drone. It has a sign warning drivers of oncoming traffic. And then it has a an LiDAR and AMP air camera that catch traffic violators and collect revenue as it's doing so. And the last drone that we designed is called Flycam, an Insta drone. It's a drone that we might allow into our lives sooner rather than later. And it's like a social media life logging tool that's like an extension of a selfie stick in a way. So we made a film depicting the drone's vision. And it's during this process of making that film that we had to like look at some of the details, some of the metadata that we had, had to generate through this film, like what that could look like. The design of like one of the um, apps that we used, what this app could look like, how it would see things, how it would recognize objects and target advertisements to you as you're flying this drone, perhaps. And then like just experimenting and getting things off the ground to like capture that footage was uh, you know, another sort of bit of our process. And also feeding shots through object recognition software to get hands on with that technology, feeding like our sort of shots that we've collected and understanding that. So <coughs> we tried to reach out to different audiences. And one way we do that is through exhibitions. And what we normally do is we show the five drones alongside the film depicting their vision. And we've shown it at the V&A exhibition in London, 212 design site in Tokyo, and recently at the ZKM in Germany. But we've also been looking at um, more experimental formats to get our ideas and our thinking out there. So this is Superflux magazine. It's an A1 size poster that has our drone infrastructure map on one side, and the other side it has an editorial written by Warren Ellis and drone fictions written by Tim Morn. It allows us to like, disseminate our knowledge through different sort of formats that we're constantly experimenting with. And another way that we've been trying to do that is through drone workshops. So I've been like, leading and facilitating these drone workshops that get different audiences to get hands-on with the technology, fabricating drone frames from scratch and understanding its limitations and capabilities as they do so. So in the workshop, we get students or whoever's doing the workshop to plan out what they want a future drone to do. And we take apart a Hubsan X4, which is like a mini sort of consumer drone that you can buy. We combine it with Arduino boards and sensors to make it as realistic as possible. And this gets them to get a hands-on feel for the tech and a greater understanding of what it's capable of. We get like a diverse set of outcomes from it. People imagine sort of a deception drone to what a spider networking drone could look like, to even a proximity sensor drone that could warn you when um, things are near it. But you know, people discovered that sometimes they were too heavy to fly and they wouldn't lift off. They had to go back and adapt them and refine these shapes because not in the end, you know, you realize that not, uh, not everything that you're going to make is going to work. You have to tweak it. You have to like um, look into it and understand why it's not working and eventually make it work. So that helped us understand the failures and limitations. These are a few other examples of the drones m that we made with a group of 16-year-old students. And they sort of like got to play around with it and made their own sort of shapes. But then they kind of understood around the dynamics of flight and, you know, if um, things were blocking the propellers, the drone wouldn't fly properly. They had to, like, clear that away and understand the weight and stuff. 
So the workshop seeks to open up the technology a bit and get people started on making and flying their own drones. But it also had a critical lens that let participants think about what drones could become in the future and how attaching a few simple sensors could completely change the narrative of the drone completely. So we're looking for more opportunities to do the workshop with different audiences and age groups to get a feel about what they think about the tech. So the last project that I'm going to talk about is called Buggy Air. And Buggy Air is an accurate mobile sensing kit that goes onto a buggy. It helps parents understand their children's exposure to air pollution. But it's kind of like our first foray into the Internet of Things. And we're working with a sister company called the Internet of Things Academy, as well as Science Scope and Virtual Technology, to understand the hardware and software. We're, we're making it in collaboration with all those different companies. So Buggy Air is not only a sensor kit or IoT product, but a live ecosystem. We have been using this product as a pilot to learn what works, what breaks, within the much-hyped IoT product world and when you actually make and deploy something within communities. So we've been making these kits and deploying them with different groups around London. Now, there's, like a, hel there's, um, there's a lot of health impacts from poor air, air quality that's costing the UK about 16 billion a year. And there are several like, health implications, especially with children suffering the worst consequences, developing asthma and like, breathing problems. So currently, most monitoring is done with expensive stationary uh, equipment that's often like very high up. And the vast array of cheap sensors out there don't provide enough accuracy. So we want to like not make them static, but we want to make them mobile and move around. So the sensors that we've made measure carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and PM2.5. Now. PM2.5 are the small sort of fine particles that you breathe in, and they're often generated by cars and the way they break, releasing dust from the tires. It has the biggest impact on public health, and it stems on a long-term exposure to fine particles. So breathing this in through long-term space really like, you know, has a big impact on your health. So it's through... Um, so the kits that we've made, the sensors communicate with a mobile app, and this data is collected and stored and uploaded to a database where the data is anonymized. And this is then visualized onto a website. So um, the people that tried the kit, they go out on a journey, they will come back and they go onto their computer and see the data visualized in the sort of IOTA website platform. But by only putting, out the kit, putting the kit out there, we began to understand how people perceive and view their data. So the first version of the visualization didn't make sense to anyone. They didn't understand what they were looking at here. And we're constantly trying to improve and work on new versions of that visualization, making a version that they're going to understand and get as soon as they see it, like identifying the bad and good routes that they've taken. But another aspect of the project is this understanding of data. And we want the participants that use the kit to um, you know, own that data. We want it we want to make it visible and private only to them, and we want to have, we want to give them the power to do what they want with that data, whether it's share it with their communities, share it with their local government, or not share it at all because it's their data and they own it. They've been collecting it. So building the prototypes in the studio had a sort of design element to them. In the end, we built about, at the moment, we built about ten prototypes, and we've deployed that with a number of different groups in London. But we had to like open up the studio in, and do this kind of like batch production micro factory thing where we took over the studio again and held those like sensors around and trying to build these kits so they could be given to people. But alongside the kits that we give to people, we've developed this research guide that we also give it to them. Of course, this is a prototype at the moment, but the research guide gives them more information about the bigger issue of air pollution and the bigger issue around data so they can understand that a bit more. So the first version of the prototype was very clumsy and it fit into a bag, but we found out that the airflow going through it wasn't really working that well and didn't give good data. The next version kind of tended to crack because of the material that we were using, and it kind of attracted a lot of insects and wasps. So that's kind of a lesson, like, don't, don't make anything yellow unless you want to att attract insects and wasps. So it was only through um, our field trials that we began to understand the sort of cultures that people were creating around the technology. And it's the stories and insights that we learned from people 
that help us to like move the project forward. So having a chat with people and being in their home environment really made you understand the sort of problems and things they were dealing with. The way they understood the data. The fact that they lacked motivation sometimes to go out and collect data because they had busy lives. You know, when in some cases when I was interviewing some people, the children were screaming and going around you and it was chaos. And you don't really realize it until you get into someone's house and talk to them about this. But m mainly from that, many of the stories that came out of it were great, of great value to us. Some participants told us about how um, they sort of ended up using the device on their bike because one person felt that she was in more, she had more control over her bike than the buggy. The buggy for her seemed like something that was owned by the child that was using it, and she could she could feel more, f a lot more freer to use her bike with the sensor than with the buggy. And also stories about how um, one mum was explaining to her kids, you know, what it was that this kit was measuring, getting them to understand the challenges of air pollution and sensor technology, and letting them understand the risk and challenges, because ultimately they're the ones that it's going to affect the most. So for Feynman, having a curiosity about simple things and working them out for himself helped him to retain an attitude of play towards his professional work. And like a kid, exploring forms through Lego bricks, through iterations and constantly building and experimenting things, you begin to understand and reveal what it is you're trying to piece together with your world of knowledge. And to summarize, we've kind of like immersed ourselves in the world of hype and clever marketing. The promises that are made, that promise to make our lives better through connected things and systems. And we've gone beyond that to reveal the sort of realities where things are messy, they break, they have hidden agendas sometimes. And we've e examined two different projects where we've revealed like different fragments and details and challenges that let us uh, understand something complex and intangible through making and getting our hands messy and dirty in the process. So to distill some of our learnings, um, you know, we can say that we tend to challenge what we are told. We kind of tend to like trust our instincts through making and experimenting with things and to find out the invisible layers behind the technology. So this is what helps us navigate through a project sometimes, and this is what gives us understanding around what we are doing and what we are making. So thank you, and thanks for listening. Hopefully this gave you a, a little bit of an insight into some of the experiences I've done with some of the projects that have been presented to you. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really fascinating, especially that I feel for many of us, it's a dream job to have a job that you can actually get your hands on something tangible and play around with it and iterate it. Guys, if you have any question, that uh, right now it's time for that. So we have a you know, couple of minutes for that. Go ahead. Uh, hey, I have a question about those workshops that you were telling yeah. us, us about. Uh, I wonder what is the favorite draw, drone that you've seen built by someone? Um, maybe one of the favorite ones is there was a group of 16-year-olds that they were kind of like not very motivated for the workshop and they were kind of just sitting there. But <laughs> they kind of made this drone with all these spikes coming going through it and it kind of had their own sort of personality to that drone. And it was a bit dangerous, but they kind of gave life yeah. into it really there's another group who made like this flotation drone and they were like using this sort of material to make it like float on water but it didn't really work in the end but they were like interested in making these weird sort of shapes with it okay thanks, thanks. um do you uh does this work? Yeah. Um, do you, are there any like commercial applications of your work or do you guys do mainly like uh, research slash? Yeah, we, um, like we tend to do a lot of research and development work. Obviously we do a lot of like client projects that um, are more commercial, but yeah, there's kind of like that balance in our studio between those two types of like work, but yeah. Uh, 
Um, I was curious if you have a particular um, either kind of material or process that you like to use to experiment. If it's, you know, with the 3D printer you mentioned or, or Arduino or some other mm. kind of platform. Um, something that I like to experiment with, um, I guess, yeah, maybe 3D printing is a good example because we're, we're still trying to understand the capabilities of it and trying to refine and use it in our way. But yeah, I kind of like experiment with that a lot, like building small parts. I never like printed anything big yet because it takes a long time, obviously. But just um, messing around with 3D printing and like sensors and Arduino, trying to build something. That's what I kind of do. Um, again, about workshops, um, I'm building drones myself uh, okay. in the house, and I'm always finding that um, the learning curve of, curve of actual flying is mm. super high. And did you like use special flight controllers, or or you just like told people it's gonna be hard and and you, you need to learn because those concept of throttle, yo, mm. uh, etc. It's it's pretty like hard to understand at, at first. So how yeah. you solved that? Um, well, the workshops that we did, we used the, the small Hubsan drone, which is kind of like it looks like a toy, but it's actually quite difficult to fly. Um, so like we got them to like you know understand the throttle and like the way that it did fly and like we let them crash it because you know they kind of got an understanding of like if you push it too hard it's going to fly up and like yeah as, as pilots like say if you're not crash it you're not flying so yeah. yeah but we got them to experiment with that first of all to get a feel for that and then we brought in some um other drones like bigger drones so they could fly those like the parrot one but that's very easy to fly it's a lot different from the hub sand. you know it has so built-in software, so it can't fly above a certain height. <coughs> yeah. So you 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 didn't like um, teach them the process why it's flying this way. Just like gave them the like more manual version and then more automatical version. Yeah. Yeah, we we got them to experiment with the two, so they oh. could compare and contrast them. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much. It was really, really good talk, and thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>